This morning, go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. Most important message that there is is the message of salvation. It's the one that makes all the difference in the world. You know, you can... Uh, you can have all, you can know all the Bible stories. You can have the books of the Bible memorized. You can know the Ten Commandments. You can even follow most of the commandments in the Bible. You know, not every, you know, obviously no one is perfect. Everybody has broken some of the commandments, but you could be the most, I mean, Bible following person that there is. You could be the best person, but the truth is, if you don't have salvation, it doesn't do you any good following all those laws. And you can, you can have the whole Bible memorized. But if you don't have salvation, you don't really have, you don't have anything. And you can, you can know, you could know, be the best in all the Bible trivia, you know, challenges that there are. And you, but yet at the same time, if you are wrong on salvation, what good is it? And when it comes to the doctrine of salvation and how to get saved, Obviously, that is one of the main things that the devil is going to try to twist and that he's going to try to pervert and that he's going to try to confuse people on because that is the one thing that if people get that, they can go to heaven. You can go to heaven. You can get saved without having the Ten Commandments memorized or without being able to quote the 66 books of the Bibles frontwards and backwards. I could say it backwards, but is that going to get me into heaven? Absolutely not. You know, they, you, can have, you can have John 3.16 memorized, but if you are wrong on salvation, what good is it? Even if you, you, you might have the cleanest record in here. Morally, you might be the best person in here, but if you're wrong on salvation, what good was it? It didn't do any good. And salvation, sadly, it is something that it's so simple. The message of salvation is so simple, but yet it is constantly being complicated by so-called Bible scholars, by false religion, messing with the most important of all doctrines. And one of the ways that people kind of do this, one of the ways they kind of mess with salvation, because it is, it is so simple. When you read the Bible, it is so simple how someone gets saved. In the Bible, they never gave long, complicated answers. When a man, when a man said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Not real complicated. Pretty simple. John 3.16, you know, it says, For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's real simple. We have people, they do, they try to find ways to complicate it all the time. And one of the things that people do sometimes is they'll start throwing these things at you like, well, how did people get saved in the Old Testament? How did they get saved before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because you all teach that you have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Well, what did they do before that happened? How did they get saved then? Obviously, there must have been a different way of salvation. And I personally believe people have always been saved the same way. So, but how? Before that even happened. You know, and they, and they, they start complicating things. And, then, and I don't want to get in this because I don't want to bore you to tears with it, but you've got this dispensational salvation that people are teaching you know, the different ways that people got saved. And all it is is a way to complicate salvation. And there's people out there that are even teaching in the tribulation. It's basically a works-based salvation. And salvation has never and will never be about works. Never. It never has. It never will be. And in Hebrews chapter 11, I believe it is proof of that. And let's go ahead and start reading. Uh, let's start reading in uh, verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out, 
into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared for them a city. So right, what I want to talk about this morning is salvation through the ages. And, right, and so right here in the beginning of this chapter, no, you know, it mentions creation. It says by, and it says that we know of creation by faith. Now listen, I enjoy, how many has ever you know, heard of guys like Kent Hovind and these guys that do the creation seminars and things? I, I enjoy those things immensely. They're a lot of fun. Um, they're, they're very interesting. I like hearing about creation. I enjoy listening to people talk about the scientific proof of creation. However, do you all understand that we don't need those things? And the truth is, hopefully you don't believe in creation because of science. Hopefully you believe in creation by faith. That's how we, that's how we know these things. That's how we understand them by faith. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. What does that mean? Well, it means exactly what it says. In Genesis 1, where it says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, God spoke everything into existence. Everything came by the Word of God. Now, you try to explain that to me scientifically. You can't do that. But you know what? I believe that, and I believe it by faith. And we've got people all the time, you know, we've got, we got to figure out how to use science to prove to people that God created the world. Well, if they're not going to believe the Bible, if they're not going to have faith, then you know what? It's not going to do any good. We've got people, I I used to think this when I was younger, I would hear the stories about Noah's Ark and the people who went on the search for Noah's Ark. And I'm like, man, if they could ever find Noah's Ark up in Mount Ararat, then everybody would believe the story about Noah and the Ark. And everybody would know that the Bible is true. But you know what? We don't need Noah's Ark. We have the Word of God. And if we're not, I mean, if we would believe, how would that make God feel if we're going to believe a boat and a mountain, but we won't believe His Word? God wants us to believe His Word. God wants us to believe Him. God is under no obligation at all to allow them to find Noah's Ark. And if they ever find it, that would be cool. But you know what? I don't need Him to find it for me to believe it. I looked for Noah's Ark one time on Google Earth, but I couldn't find it. But uh, the truth truth is we don't need need those things. But we believe it by faith. And I do. I enjoy that stuff. If they ever find Noah's Ark, that'll be cool. I would have fun rubbing it into some evolutionist's face. But you know what? It's not going to help him believe. If he's not willing to believe the Word of God, he's, he's not going to believe at all. And so and they will, they'll come up with some kind of excuse. They'll, they'll, they'll figure out some way to spin it to fit their crazy religion of evolution. But anyway, but if, people, they, if people don't have faith, they're not going to believe God. We, when we believe God, it is by faith. We saw where it said without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so it starts out just, you know, hey, even things like creation, we believe in these things by faith. And then it starts talking about people who got saved and their salvation. And it keeps mentioning their faith. And I want to show you some things that these all have in common. That I think is very interesting. First of all, it mentions Abel. Okay. What did Abel do to get saved? What, what was it that Abel did to get saved? Well, when we read here in verse 4, you know, it said that he offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, okay? by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So did, was Abel righteous because he was better than Cain? It talks, in the, if you go back in Genesis where it talks about their offerings and how Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. 
What a lot of uh, modern preachers say whenever they talk about, I think some of the modern Bibles have even said this, but I've heard, I hear a lot of the modern preachers, what they'll say was, well, Cain brought the inferior fruit of the ground, but Abel brought the best that he had. Well, you know, the Bible doesn't say he brought the inferior fruit. I, I think it's, he very well could have brought the very best. I think what Cain did required a whole lot more work than what Abel did. But God wanted a sacrifice. And now think about this because so it, does, it makes more sense that Cain's offering would be acceptable as payment for his sins because it required a lot more work. But Abel's offering, you know, uh, think of it. Now forget that you know the New Testament. Forget that you know any of the Bible. This is before the law was given. And this is before there's not been one person that has died. This is early on. Who knows if they had seen, you know, they probably hadn't seen too many animals die at this point. They, who knows if they'd even killed anything at this point. We don't see them start eating meat until after the flood. And, I, I, and, and so think about Abel when God tells him to sacrifice that lamb and he goes and he takes that lamb and he's killing it. And he's think. imagine in his mind, why am I killing this lamb for my sins? It didn't do anything. I'm the one who sinned. Why would I kill a lamb to pay for my sins? Now, you and I know exactly why he would do that. Because that was a picture of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, paying for our sins. But did Abel know that? Abel absolutely did not know that. But what did Abel do when God told him to sacrifice a lamb? You know what he did? He believed God. Okay. This doesn't make sense killing a lamb to pay for my sins. My brother Cain, he did a lot more work than I'm going to have to do. All I've got to do is slit this thing's throat or whatever, however he decided to kill it. Cain did a lot of work, took a lot of time to grow all that, to plan all that, all the things that he had to do. But okay, God, I'll do what you, I'll do what you said to do. And he believed God, and because of that, he was considered righteous in the eyes of God. Because by faith, he believed God. And then look at what, you know, look at what it says in verse five by faith, Enoch. Now, Enoch, I think is a very, is a fascinating character, but the Bible doesn't say very much about Enoch. He's mentioned in Jude. He was somebody who preached about a coming judgment that has still yet to come. He, in Genesis, what we're going to look what it says, you know, the Bible doesn't say much about him, but look what it says by faith. Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So what was it that pleased him? Well, we know it, because of verse 6, it was because he had faith. Because it says he pleased God. And in verse 6, it says without faith, it is impossible to please him. So did Enoch have faith? Absolutely. Well, how do we see that faith? Okay, With Abel, we see him sacrifice the lamb because that's what God told him to do. He believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Enoch, he pleased God. What was it he did that pleased God so much? We'll go back to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. We don't know a whole lot about it. We don't know much about Enoch. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot of stories, and we don't believe in the book of Enoch around here. And, you know, I don't think we can give that a whole lot of credibility. But it says in verse 21, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. 300 years and beget sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 365 and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Y'all see that right there? All it says that he did is that he walked with God. So where do we see that Enoch ever believed God? Because we have to believe God by faith. Well, I believe we see it crystal clear when it says Enoch walked with God because it says in Amos 3, verse 3, very clearly, can two walk together except they be agreed. Y'all see that? Enoch, he obviously believed God, didn't he? He could not walk with God unless he agrees with God. And listen, if we agree with God, it's, because of, it's going to be because of faith. Does our sinful flesh agree with God? Do we line up with God? Do, do, we, you know, do we just naturally want to do the things of God? Who here just feels like loving their enemies. Who in here feels like, you know, 
live in holy lives. You know, we, we have to force ourselves to do these things. And Enoch was somebody who walked with God. Why? Because he agreed with God. He, he believed God by faith. And Enoch, he was saved because by faith and, and because he believed in God. And so then look at verse, uh, lost my spot. Look at verse six. You know, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We cannot please God without faith. And we cannot please God with works. All right, now y'all need to catch this. All right, I'm going to say it again because y'all aren't looking like you're getting it here. We cannot please God without faith. And you cannot please God with your works. We need to understand that because most people today, most religions today, are constantly trying to make salvation about works in one way or the other. They're trying to add works to salvation thinking that will please God. There's no way these people are getting saved just because they believed on Christ and asked Him, I've got to see some works. Let me see some works. But the the thing we don't realize is we can't please God with our works. Somewhere along the lines, we just... We got to look in way too much at people and the way we are in church and in Christianity. And we thought that, you know what, this is righteousness. You know, I'm afraid sometimes we look at each other and we see us. We're dressed up for church. We're sitting in church. We've got our Bibles in front of us. We're singing the songs. We're being real spiritual. We're praying with everybody. And we get to looking at each other and thinking we're pretty good. But you all understand the only thing that makes us special here is the fact that we have faith in Jesus Christ and in His goodness and in His works, and our works still stink. And when you do, when you hear these preachers, they get up and they start saying, you know, if you're not doing this, if you're not doing that, you're not really saved. Well, do you you realize how hypocritical that is? So do you think because you're preaching in a pulpit, you're righteous? You think because these other people go to church and because they give their money in the offering, because they, you know, go soul winning, whatever, you think they're righteous because of those works? So did they, did works now just start pleasing God all of a sudden? Whatever happened to our righteousness is a filthy rag. Listen, the, all these good things we do, we do them so we can get rewards in heaven. Not so we can go to heaven and we forget that a person who gets saved it is not a person who starts doing all the things that Baptists do. The person who gets saved is the one who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to get blessings, I would recommend doing what the Baptists do. I would recommend going to the Baptist church and following their doctrines. If you want to be blessed, if you want to have a victorious life, if you want to make a difference, I highly recommend an independent fundamental King James Bible preaching Baptist church. But if you're just going through here thinking, I can, I can get to heaven through these people, you're going to be very disappointed. Because while we might look, look okay, in the eyes of God, we stink. In the eyes of God, we're wicked. And we, I, I wish people could figure that out. We are not that great. And we can't, we, we're not going to please God by our works. We please Him by our faith. So what does that mean? Does God not care about our works? You know, because we, we talk about you know, doing things like going to church that pleases God. But you understand, here's why going to church pleases God. Because if going to church and getting baptized got you to heaven, okay, Those would be works-based. But God said, going to church, getting baptized, that doesn't have anything to do with going to heaven. But yet, we're still doing it. What does that mean? It must mean we just want to please God. These laws that we obey in the Bible, the things that we preach about here, things that we tell you you should do, things we tell you you shouldn't do, we, I never put on there, if you don't do this, you're not going to heaven. Or if you do this, you know, you're going to go to hell. We don't do that. What do we do? We're trying to tell you, hey, do these things because these things will please God. But they we're pleasing God doing these things because it shows that we have faith. I'm not doing this to get into heaven. I'm doing it because I love God. And He sees that effort and it pleases Him because we are doing it simply because we want to. And we see also verse 7. It mentions Noah. By faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Noah. 
Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found it before he built the boat. Noah didn't get saved by building the ark. Noah got saved when he believed God. God told him he was going to destroy the world. Noah believed God. And it, and it, because of that, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was righteous and God told him to build that ark. But understand, he didn't get saved when he start build, started building the ark. He got saved when he believed God. But then, but then we see after he believed God and get saved, God had him build an ark. So we see everybody, they believe God and they got saved. And then they did a work, you could say. And so what is the work that we do after we get saved? Well, I'll show you that in a little bit. But we do. So we see with each one, that is the case. And then look at verse 8. Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with whom of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We see what Abraham did. It's, and it flat out tells us this in Genesis. We're not going to take time to go back and read it. But the Bible says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. God told Abraham, I'm going to multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven. And Abraham believed God. God told him to go to a strange land that he didn't know about, a place he had never been before. And God was going to make a great nation of him. And Abraham believed God. He believed God by faith. And we see he did. He went and Abraham. And so, you know, Abraham, I mean, there's multiple times in the Bible it's mentioned in the New Testament where Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. He believed by faith. Sarah, the same thing. What did Sarah do to get saved? Well, it says in verse 11 and 12, through faith, Sarah uh, herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful, which promised. She was told that she was going to have a son in her old age. Now, at first she laughed, didn't she? At first she laughed, and at first she's like, uh, no, that's not going to happen. But you know what? Thank God that if we reject His Word, if we reject the Gospel the first time, He doesn't say, all right, you're done for. He gives us, he's, you know, many of us, He's given multiple opportunities. It took many times for some before they finally got saved. So, yeah, Sarah didn't believe it at first, but you know what? She changed her mind later. She repented later and she believed. And you know what? Sure enough, after she believed, she had a son. Just like, just like God had said. But she believed by faith. And what did she do? She gave birth to a son. Was it giving birth to a son that saved her? Or was it her believing God by faith? It was her believing God by faith. And then it says in verse 13, notice this. It says, these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar. But wait a minute. Sarah received her promise, didn't she? She had a son. Abraham received his promise, didn't he? He went, he went into that land. You know, he saw a son. Obviously, he didn't get to see the descendants multiplied. Didn't these people get the things that they were looking for? No, the Bible says these all died in faith. Why is that? Because this is the thing that many people are missing. The things that God promised in the Old Testament, they were spiritual. They weren't physical. They were spiritual promises. Listen, when you got saved, did your body change into a body like Christ? Did you become perfect all of a sudden? No, but spiritually you revived. Spiritually you, came, you became alive. You received eternal life. But you understand we believe that by faith. God promised them things and he gave them some earthly things, but the spiritual promises they did not get while they were on this earth. They died in faith. They died waiting for those things. You see, you know, Abel, he obeyed God. He believed God. But what happened after that? He died, didn't he? He got killed, but he's received eternal life though, didn't he? He's in heaven today. You know, Enoch, he left everything behind on earth, you know, but you know, including his family. But you know what? He's still with the Lord today, isn't he? We see that you know, Noah survived the flood. That was his salvation, surviving the flood, right? 
Well, not really, because he eventually died of something else later, didn't he? You know, and you know, Abraham, he lived in a tent his whole life. God promised him that whole land of Israel and the, the borders that God originally gave him were far greater than what's considered Israel today. And God said, Abraham, that's yours. But yet Abraham had to live in a tent his whole life. You know why? Because who cares about a physical land? It's only temporary. He was, they were looking for a heavenly country, the Bible says. These were spiritual promises. Sarah, she only gave birth to one son, but now she is seen as the mother of those who are of faith. Turn over to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Because the Bible says Sarah didn't receive the promise. But wait, she did. She received her son. But no, her promise was so much more than just one son. God was going to give her more, you know, the, the barren. Well, I'll, I better read it. I won't quote it right. Look at what it says in verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Talking about Sarah. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath and husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Do you all see that? Sarah is considered spiritually the mother of us all. Why? Because we are the children of promise, just like Isaac was. What Sarah received, it was more than just physical. It was a spiritual blessing. And our salvation that we have right now, folks, it is a spiritual blessing. We've got way too many people, whenever it comes to somebody's salvation, they're looking for physical things. All right, I want to see a difference. Oh, that person, man, they got saved, but they haven't got a haircut yet. What's going on? You know, they, they haven't changed just about themselves. That They still look pretty. I don't think that person's really safe looking at physical things. Where are they at today? Where are all those people that got saved at, you know, yesterday out door knocking? Why aren't they here today? I don't think those people really got saved. Looking for something physical. You all realize salvation is a spiritual thing. And even though you're saved, and even though you're still in church, you still aren't that great. You still, you're, you're, st you're no better than the people sitting at home watching TV today. The only difference between you and them, if you're here today, is you're actually get, enjoying your salvation. They're not, but they've still got it. You all are in a position where you can receive the blessings that come with salvation. They're not, but y'all understand if they believed on Christ, they still have salvation because it's about faith. It is not about works. He said, but no, we see here in all these things, it talked about something that they did after they got saved. And even people who are on our side many times when it comes to salvation, that they believe it's not of works, they'll try to say, well, if there's no works after the salvation, then that means they never really got the salvation. Okay, but, and they, they'll use these things, you know, because, you know, Abel, he believed God, he got saved, but then he sacrificed the lamb. You know, Noah believed God, he got saved, but then he built the ark. Abraham believed God, got saved, but then he went to the strange land. So obviously we have to do something after we're saved if we're really saved, right? Well, let's look, let's look because what, you know, fine. What is it? What do you think we have to do? This is what I've asked some of these preachers that say this stuff. All right, so what is your standard of living that someone has to live up to to prove they're saved? And I've heard some people say, well, they'll, they'll at least go to church. I talked to a Pentecostal guy one time. He said, well, they'll at least get baptized and speak in tongues. You know, and, and, you know, and then, then there's other preachers that are out there, you know, man, if you don't start dressing right and dressing night nice seven days of the week and you don't quit cussing and you don't throw out your TV and you don't do, you know, I don't think you got saved. And then you got some of these goofballs on the internet, you know, if you don't support Israel, you're not really saved. You know, and people, everybody's got a different standard. And do you all really, our standards are a joke compared to God's standard. Why would, we, why would we even try to put any kind of standard? Listen, this is what we do after we get saved. This is what God expects from us. After we get saved. See, the rest of the chapter, if you read the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about, it mentions some of the same people, and it talks about other things that they did by faith that caused them to do great works. After we get saved, if we will have faith, we can do great things for God. 
by faith. Those things don't have anything to do with salvation. But you know, as a church, if we will be a people of faith, if we will continue in our faith, we can do great things for God. And that's kind of what the rest of the chapter is talking about. But what is it today that we do? Okay, what do we do to get saved? Well, we believe God by faith. We do this by trusting in the work of Jesus Christ as payment for our sins. Okay? It's like well, people say, well, they didn't, you know, you have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They didn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ back then. No, but they believed God. And do you all understand? Jesus made it very clear you cannot believe God and then not believe in Jesus and his works. You all understand that? And as time has gone on, God has revealed more of himself. Okay? And so right now, if you were to say, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in God, the Father, you don't believe in God the Father. Or if you were to say, well, I, I'm Jewish, I believe in God the Father, but I don't believe in Jesus. The Bible makes it very clear that that's impossible. If you don't believe Jesus, you don't believe the Father. If you don't believe the Word of God, you don't believe God. The Bible is very clear about that. So understand, our belief, their, if, if our belief in Jesus Christ is belief in God, then their belief in God before Jesus was belief in Jesus Christ too. Obviously, we have more of the plan revealed to us. We know more, but you can't separate those things. And when we say that we are trusting in the work of Christ, to save us as payment for our sins. You know what we're, you know what we're doing? This is, this is what we do after we get saved. All right, I called on the Lord for salvation. Now what do I do? I keep trusting that His Word is true and that I'm going to go to heaven. You know, all right, uh, nothing really changed physically. I still look the same. I, I didn't see... I didn't see any magical signs. I didn't see any bright light. I didn't speak in tongues. So, so where do I go from here? Hey, just keep trust, trusting God. I, I believe I'm going to heaven. I am betting my soul on the work of Jesus Christ. I'm not doing anything right now to get myself into heaven. Oh, well, you're going to church, you're preaching. I'm, I'm doing this for the rewards. I'm doing this out of love for God. I'm doing this because I love God. I'm not doing this so I can go to heaven. I'm doing it because I love, I love God. That's why. And we see that you know, a works-based salvation, it will only send you to hell. Those who try to work for their salvation don't believe God. You know, can't, Abel could have said, Lord, the, the, my brother's sacrifice makes more sense. I'm going to do that. But no, he believed God and he did what God said. You know, it makes more sense to us to say, you know what? The Catholics, their way's got to be better. I mean, look how big they are. You know, look at how majestic their buildings are. And they got the Vatican. And look at all the things they do, man. They do those seven sacraments. They go confessing their sins. They do those little uh, things where the girls wear the wedding dresses, uh, first communions and all that stuff. You know, they, they do all these things. Surely those people are going to go to heaven before we are. You know, okay, maybe not them, but you know, what about them hardcore Pentecostals that, you know, they dress like they're from back in the old days. You know, they, I mean, live real holy, clean lives. The guys won't even wear short sleeves and the, you know, the women all dress super modest and they, you know, and those people, man, they're, they're obviously better. We are, or the Amish, okay? The Amish have got us all beat, right? When it comes to outward things. Surely they're going to go to heaven before we are. But listen, the Bible is very clear. If you're trusting in your works, you're not saved. It's those who trust in the work of Jesus Christ. Those who rely on him. What did, what did he say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And when we say, okay, we do, we, we believe that. When you believe that, what do we do? We call on the Lord. How, how do we do that? Well, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's it. Some people, they don't believe that and therefore they won't do it. But when you get that, that's all I got to do. This isn't about my works. I'll do that. That person is saved. And people who will not do that, it's because they don't believe God. They don't believe that God will save them when they don't do anything. You know, they, they have no faith. They fail to understand 
that the scriptures were trying to, te- you know, to teach us that we cannot save ourselves. We all come short of the glory of God. Listen, if you did something to me, if you went and you killed my son, don't ever come to me and say, listen, Pastor, what can I do to make up for that? You can't make up for that. You can't make up for murder. And you know what? We've sinned against God. Because of our sin, Jesus Christ had to die. And for us to come to God and say, Lord, what can I do to make up for my sins? You know, to go to Jesus who paid for our sins, who suffered that horrible death on the cross, and to say, what can I do to make up for those sins? Can I go to church? Will that make up? Can I go get baptized and that'll make up? Don't come to me and after you killed my son and say, listen, if I wash your car, will, that, will, will we be good? After what I did to you, hey, what if I give? What if I give you a thousand? What if I give you a million dollars? Hey, you can't make up for something like that. We can't make up for what we did to God. And you know what God wants from us for uh, for Him to put a price tag that we could pay. It would absolutely cheapen what well, His the life of His Son. And for me to do that, for me to say, yeah, you know, what? if you give me a million dollars, I'll forgive you for killing my son. Well, what does that tell my other son? So if somebody kills me, they can get out. Of, so I'm not. I'm only worth a million dollars. You know, aren't we supposed to believe? And it isn't supposed to be our kids are worth more than any money in the world. And you know what? If somebody does something that horrible, it would be like spitting in my face and spitting in my son's face to try to make up for it. But you know what? I would like to hear from that person. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I can't make up for that, but I'd like your forgiveness. And do you understand that's what God wants from us? For us to try to make up for our sins is to spit in the eye of His Son, and He just wants us to acknowledge it and say, Lord, I have I, I sinned. He died on the cross for my sins. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. And when we do that, you know what? He gives us forgiveness every time. He'll give us that gift of salvation. And so we, it is very clear that we, we cheapen it. And you know what? Bible te- Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ... We ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself For me, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You know, I had a guy one time tell me, you know, I kept telling you, you know, listen, it's not about works. It's not about works. And they're like, you know, and they're like, well, look at what the Bible says. Whenever the Bible says it's not about works, it's talking about the works of the law. Okay, I agree with that. But do you all understand that for something to be sin? It has to be a transgression of the law. So what in the you know what in the world? Yeah, it's the works of the law, but we're all guilty of the works of the law, and we cannot be justified by the works of the law. And it's like they're trying to say, no, you got to start doing these other things. You know, you can't do these sins. You know, those are, that's just specifically the works of the law. Well, listen, there is no sin unless it's a transgression of the law. That makes no sense, folks. Amen. But people do. They want to find some way to put a work. Well, that's not a work of the law. That's just a a different work. Sorry, folks. It's not of works. Galatians 3.8 in the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the Gospel unto Abraham saying, And these shall all nations be blessed so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you want to try being good to get yourself to heaven, don't you dare break one single law. I don't know about you, but I'll take the work of Jesus Christ. Because you know what? I've already broken too many of those laws. 
But no man is justified by the law on the side of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. That's an Old Testament verses quoting right there. You know, that's mentioned many times in the Old Testament. The just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Psalms 143. Also, Old Testament. Verse 1. A Psalm of David. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplication and thy faithfulness. Answer me and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant. For in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Y'all see that? We can't be justified by, in the sight of God by our works. And he, what did he say? He said, you know, give ear to my supplication and thy faithful answer me and in thy righteousness. We can only get to heaven through his righteousness, not through our righteousness. Isaiah 53, 6, also Old Testament, all we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb, so opened he not his mouth. I had a conversation with a guy this week that thinks that God is going to save Israel through some other covenant. But listen, Isaiah 53, 6, he is prophesying this to Israel. And in the New Testament, when Jesus Christ is dying on the cross, dying on the cross, that he fulfilled that verse. And the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, he was reading that passage. And what did Philip tell him? He's like, hey, who's he writing about? Is he writing about himself or someone else? And what did Philip do? He preached unto him Jesus. You know why? Because it was the work that Jesus did on the cross that paid for the sins of everyone from the beginning of time to the end of time. It was His covenant. His blood was, the, was that New Testament. His blood was that new covenant that was promised to Israel. And it paid for the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. The way to salvation has always been by faith. It's always been believe God by faith. And you can't separate believing in God from believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those in the Old Testament, they might not have known the name of Jesus Christ then, but you know what? When they believe God, they believe in Jesus Christ. They, believe, they might not have known the whole story of the gospel because it hadn't happened yet, but they believed the gospel. Whether they knew it or not, you can't separate those things. And so we need, we, need, we need to realize this and we got to stop letting people complicate salvation. It's simple, folks. Stop getting this bad attitude towards people that aren't doing everything you think they ought to do. And all oh, those people aren't saying, I don't know why we go soul winning. You know, I don't think these people are really getting saved. Why? If they're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, if they're calling on Him for salvation, they're getting saved. Well, where's the works? Do you see where in the, anywhere in the Bible where it says we're justified by works? We read several verses where it says we're not justified by our works. So you know what? I'd love to see these people get in church. I'd love to see them all start enjoying the blessings that come with serving God. But you know what? I would rather see them live a miserable life on earth and go to heaven than live a miserable life on earth and go to hell. And that's what people, that's what a lot of churches are doing today. They're just like, you know what? This isn't changing anybody. So let's just let them go to hell. You know, they're critical of churches that will go and soul win in a town far away where there's no church because like, where are those people supposed to go to church? Well, I don't know, but you know what? I don't see in the Bible where it says going to church will get you to heaven, but I do see where believing in the Lord Jesus Christ will get you out of hell. And so let's at least do that. I mean, boy, our priorities are all messed up. You know why it is? It's because today church has become about building a kingdom here on this earth i want you know past I, I want to have my own kingdom i want to have my you know big crown i want to have my magnificent building you know why because they're trying to build an earthly kingdom
But those of us who believe in real soul winning, who actually believe the gospel and will go out and preach the gospel, you know why we do this? We're not necessarily receiving any great inheritance here on this earth. But let me tell you something. We're going to die in faith and we'll receive the inheritance when we get to heaven. There will be a a big congregation in, in heaven. Who knows how big our earthly congregation will ever get. But you know what? If we keep this soul winning up, if we keep on going out and getting people saved, there's going to be a big group of us in heaven. And I, that, that's what I'm interested in. Even Abraham believed that way. He was looking for that heavenly Jerusalem, that heavenly country. That's what God has promised us. That is what we're working for. And that's what we need, that's what we need to stay focused on. And so with that, let's all stand together.